the way Epicon 2021 is being organized, I have all the compliments for Dr. Shashank Joshi, Dr. Bansi Sabu, and whole team of organizers. It's a very interesting topic I'm going to talk about in Mauritian is how diabetes collide with COVID-19. All of you know that patients with diabetes, if controlled, are not believed to be more susceptible to primary infection by virus. But the presence of diabetes is now well-established risk factor for poor outcome, including high risk of intensive care unit admissions, ventilatory intubation in COVID-19 patients, and later mortality. After obesity and hypertension, conditions that frequently commingle with diabetes, diabetes itself is a third most common comorbidity associated with COVID-19 hospitalization and mortality. The reason is for this increased risk are not entirely clear, but diabetes in general and hyperglycemia and insulin resistance in particular are linked to excessive inflammation, vascular coagulability, increased risk of secondary infection, including pneumonia. Diabetic ketoacidosis is occurring at higher rates in patients with diabetes in COVID-19, which we have seen day in and day out in our clinical practice, having treated more than 18,000 COVID-19 patients. A condition that may cause cerebral edema, ARDS, myocardial infarction, and death as a consequence of rapid shift in intracellular fluid volume. Hospitals are reporting profound insulin resistance in patients with pre-existing diabetes who are admitted with SARS-CoV-2 infection, as well as new onset diabetes in some patients without prior diagnosis. So truly speaking, COVID-19 itself is a pro-coagulable state and so is diabetes. And that's a very interesting aspect that we need to know about we are managing diabetes with COVID-19. So we are going to talk about that what exactly happens in COVID-19 virus infection. This beta coronavirus belongs to the 2B group. It shares around 70 to 80% of its genome with SARS-CoV it has shown to have highest level of similarity with the horseshoe bat coronavirus. It is an RNA virus with an RNA dependent polymerase. And this is the structure of COVID-19 virus, what we call it to be coronavirus. SARS-CoV virus is having an incubation period of one to 14 days and is shed only by asymptomatic infected period. This virus is even the asymptomatic patient two to three days before the symptoms is highly infectious and it, they continue to be infectious for one to 14 days. That is very important. As earlier, there used to be a concept of fever and non-protective cough, but lately we have come across a lot of newer symptomatologies which has come in the causation of COVID-19 infection. Now, if you look at the statistics, now as on latest on 5th March yesterday, the death toll in the world has been 25 uh, million people world over have died. And in India, almost 150,000 people have passed away because of COVID-19. So definitely it is a uh, disease we need to look at this. Clinical course of major symptoms and outcome in hospitalized patient has been very interesting. The fever, cough, dyspnea, which has been there, the ICU investing in admissions are very important. There has been that invasive ventilator are being required in almost five to 7% of COVID patients who are not uh, being saved. And patient like five to 70% people of which 70 to 80 percent people are diabetic and they are very high risk patient to be managed accordingly. If you look, diabetes is the most common disease associated with COVID-19. Active cancer is found in almost 25 percent patient. There could be associated atrial fibrillation in diabetic patient, ischemic heart disease. Diabetes per se also is associated with COVID-19 almost 
very high percentage of patient and hypertension and diabetes is the second most common disease associated with the COVID-19. Comorbidities in Indian population with COVID-19 infection, there are comorbidities in almost 40% of asymptomatic patients and 60% of symptomatic patients. These comorbidity conditions are hypertension, diabetes, KHS, COPD, CKD, even the left ventricular failure, chronic liver disease, rheumatic heart disease, and uh, volvular heart disease. The prevalence of diabetes in hospitalized and ICU patient in COVID-19, one of the most commonly reported condition requiring ICU and hospitalization is a COVID-19 with diabetes. Prevalence of diabetes among hospitalized patients who are infected with SARS-CoV initially was reported to be 7 to 8%, but now it is almost to 12 to 13%. The most distinctive comorbidity of 32 non-survivor of 52 ICU patients in COVID-19 was diabetic in one of the most initial studies from China. The severe versus non-severe COVID-19 in diabetes has been found out that all critically ill COVID-19 patient has a diabetes as a comorbid condition. It was a new onset hyperglycemia or flare up of the diabetic control, which was there. In non-survival versus survival COVID-19 patient with diabetes, the survival patient had a better controlled diabetes and lesser new onset hyperglycemia while non-survival had significant fluorine diabetes, and we have seen hyperglycemia to the tune of 300 to 500 milligram person in patient with COVID-19 morbidity. The non-survivors was also higher in diabetic subject with COVID-19 in most of these studies which shows and which has been presented here. The prevalence varies from 22 to 31 percent in different studies. The risk of diabetes in COVID-19 pandemic, there has been very high risk if glycosylated hemoglobin more than 9% has been there. If the HP1AC is more than 9%, 60% of increased risk of hospitalization and pneumonia-related severity during bacterial infection has been there. Diabetes was considered as an independent risk factor for complications and deaths during 2002 to 2003 outbreak of SARS syndrome. So it has always been a center of attention predisposing to the more morbidity and mortality in diabetic patient. Higher disease severity and mortality in COVID-19 South Asians. The important observations were in hospitalized patient with COVID-19, South Asians were younger compared to whites. So we are younger people. Now, there was a higher prevalence of diabetes in South Asians because of very highly diabetic population, poorly controlled population, population with more comorbid complications of diabetes in Southeast Asians. And that, and most of the patient, almost 40% living about the HB1AC range of 9%, that makes us more prone for complications. South Asians presented with severe disease despite no delay in presentations in symptoms onset. And South Asian ethnicity was associated with high mortality in most of the studies. But here I would like to share with you, there has been a lot of studies regarding why as on today, India is improving. We are at the fag end of the pandemic of COVID-19. Our cases are declining, but in Europe and US, it continues to be there. One of the hypotheses which has come is that Asians, especially Indians, are deficient in alpha-1 antitrypsin enzyme. And this alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, which has an inhibitory action on uh, eosinophil elastase, so Asians, especially Indians, have six out of thousand are deficient in alpha-1 antitrypsin, which predisposes to the COVID virus invasion and floridity of the symptom, while Caucasians and Europeans and Americans, 55 to 60 out of 1,000 are deficient with alpha-1 antitrypsin. So that could be one of the hypothetical expedition of increased morbidity and mortality, which still continues to be in Europeans and Americans. Now, if you look at this, what exactly happens at the cellular level? When the virus enters the 
there, there is a binding of SARS-CoV virus spike protein to cell surface ACE receptor. Cellular proteases such as TM press and furin are involved in primary priming of the S protein, which involves cleavage of the S1, S2 domain. This allows the fusion of virus to the cell surface, and here it starts. Now, what are the potential mechanism once the virus enters the body? The potential mechanism is that there's a higher affinity of cellular binding, efficient wire entry which takes place, decreased virus clearance is there, there's a diminished T cell response is there, presence of CVD is there, increased susceptibility to hyperinflammation and cytokine storm syndrome is there, and this leads to reduction in the ACE2 expression and targeting DPP4 enzymes. If you look at this, SARS-CoV-2 effectively uses ACE2 to infect human cells, increases affinity, cellular binding and efficient virus entry is there. Increasing, with increasing age and male genders, ACE2 receptor associated factors significantly affect the viral clearance, decreases the viral clearance and virus stays attached to the ACE2 receptor in the body for longer time. There's a decrease in T cell function, impairment is adaptive immunity and late hyperinflammatory response is often observed. There's an increased susceptibility to hyperinflation and cytokine storm syndrome. Mortality may be due to virally driven hyperinflammation and cytokine storm syndrome could be there. We need to remember here, there's the first week of COVID-19 infection is a viral phase and second week is the inflammatory phase. So first week, the virus replication takes place. And in the second week, the cytokine storm phase is there, which is an inflammatory phase. And the hyperglycemia goes hand in hand with the cytokine uh, phase. The cytokine storm phase is recognized by the increase in the cytokine markers like IL-6, D-dimer, which is a sign of hypercoagulable state this is more marked in diabetic patient, TNF, alpha, and CRP, et cetera. Now, there has been definite correlation between COVID-19, diabetes, and ACE2 receptors. ACE2 receptors expression is reduced in diabetes, possibly due to glycation. There's a glycation of the ACE2 receptor. This might increase the predisposition to severe lung injury or ARDS with COVID-19. Blocking entry using ACE2-related therapy could be feasible to prevent spreading of infection in lungs and whole body. So we need to be very careful. And that is the way we need to correct the glycation of the ACE2 receptor. Hypertension, diabetes, and increased risk for COVID-19 is well established. And they are the most common comorbid conditions these days found in COVID-19. Truly hypertension and diabetes goes hand in hand, which can significantly increase the COVID-19 infection. Diabetes and hypertension treatment with ACE2 stimulating drugs can increase the risk of developing severe and fatal COVID-19 infection. Obesity is also integral part. Almost 35% of Indian diabetics are obese. Their BMI is more and obesity, diabetes and COVID-19 infection has been very well found to be in a one uh, common uh, critical group which can predispose to respiratory dysfunction. Obesity itself can cause impaired respiratory function, increased airway resistance, impaired gas exchange, low lung volume and low muscle strength. Comorbidities are very common in this group of patients like cardiovascular diseases, along with kidney disease, which can happen in diabetic patient. Metabolic risks are also increased in diabetic, obese, and COVID-19 patient, which includes hypertension, which includes flare-up of the pre-diabetic condition. Insulin resistance can go up and dyslipidemia could be significant. This coupled up with the pro-coagulable state of diabetic patient, as all of you know that in COVID-19, it is not only the pulmonary infection or pneumonia, but it is the ARDS and microthrombus in the lung, which is responsible for critical patient going on the ventilator. So diabetes is also a pro-coagulable stage. COVID-19 is also a pro-coagulable stage. And there's an added or summation of the pro-coagulability with microthrombus formation in diabetic patient. 
A high BMI might be an important risk factor for severe course of disease, particularly of pneumonia in such patients. Higher proportion of obese patients, especially with diabetes and COVID-19 infection required mechanical ventilation compared to non-obese and uh, non-diabetic patients. Rate of mortality was higher in obese diabetic patient, which is very well clearly depicted. High blood glucose levels and insulin resistance worsens the outcome in diabetic patients with COVID-19. It is established beyond doubt. This high blood glucose and insulin resistance promotes increased synthesis of glycation and product and pro-inflammatory cytokines. So there is always a flare-up of cytokine storm, especially in the second and third week of the COVID infection. All diabetic patients, especially uncontrolled diabetic or newly diagnosed hyperglycemic patient, the cytokine storm will be much severe and uh, critical in second and third week than the non-diabetic patient. There's an oxidative stress and production of additions molecule that mediate tissue inflammation leads to the higher tendency of infection. And all this aggravated cytokine storm with inflammatory response worsens outcome in patient with diabetes and COVID-19. Now, this is a, the pathophysiological chart, the protective effect of high levels of cardiorespiratory fitness on infection by SARS-CoV. Hence, the physical fitness is one of the important aspects to maintain the good immune status and to prevent the COVID-19 complications in the lung. I must compliment Dr. Shashank Joshi, who produced such a wonderful COVID-19 risk score. In fact, this is absolutely a phenomenal presentation. And it was a wonderful proposal by him that if you have an age more than 55 years, if you are male gender, if you are hypertensive, if you are diabetic, if you are obese, if you have chronic heart disease and use of corticosteroids or immunosuppressants for any situation like transplant, if you have COPD, asthma, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease or liver disease, any congenital or acquired immunodeficiency state, you are very vulnerable to the high morbidity and mortality. An Indian COVID-19 risk score is designed for high risk stratification from a public health perspective, save the life as narrated by Dr. Joshi, which definitely is a absolutely important skill to decide the treatment protocol of diabetic patient. Now, it is very important when a diabetic patient gets diagnosed with COVID-19, we have to be brisk at all the levels in early isolation, early management, and early diagnosis. We can have diagnosis by RT-PCR through the throat swab. Here, I would like to share with you the RT-PCR through the nasal and throat swab together has a sensitivity up to 70% only. So you need to be very careful of a diabetic patient having COVID-like symptom, even if RT-PCR is negative. Later, I'll be showing few slides that how important is HRCT test in diagnosis of COVID-19, more so if the patient has uncontrolled diabetes or patient is glucose tolerant test. Real-time PCR is very important. Positive patient, once detected, has to be aggressively treated than a non-diabetic patient. There are certain special considerations in management of diabetes and hypertension in patient with COVID-19. There is a potential role of DPP-4 inhibitors. DPP-4 degrades including like GLP-1 and glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, thus leading to the reduced insulin secretion and abnormal visceral adipose tissue metabolism. DPP-4 increases inflammation in type 2 diabetes via both catalytic and non-catalytic mechanism. DPP-4 may be a potential target for preventing and decreasing the risk and progression of active respiratory complications that type 2 diabetes may add to the COVID-19 infection. The risk of hypoglycemia is relatively lower with DPP-4 inhibitors, avoiding unfavorable hypoglycemic episodes during active COVID-19. So that's the added advantage of DPP-4 inhibitors. The beneficial effect of DPP-4 inhibitors in COVID-19 infection, it exerts antifibrotic activity. It has an anti-inflammatory or modulating the inflammatory effect, suppress tetus, T cell proliferation and production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. These properties may be of potential use for stopping 
progression to hyper inflammatory state associated with COVID-19. So it is being believed that if you use DPP-4 inhibitor, they can mild, milder or they can little uh, subdue the cytokine storm, which is a normal concomitant happening in diabetic patient in second week of COVID-19 patients. Recent evidence on pyoglitazone potential role in COVID-19 has also been there. And uh, evidence suggests that treatment with pyoglitazone does have a rational in COVID-19 management, which is very important. Now, there has been a lot of evidence about these ACE receptors blockers in COVID-19 patient. Initially, there was a debate, but several hypotheses proposed regarding the positive effect of ACE and ARB on COVID-19 infection. And probably if someone is on ACE receptor inhibitors or ARBs, we should continue that. And it has no implication in the aggravation of the disease. Truly speaking, it is to the advantage of the patient. There has been one of the most commonly used anti-diabetic drug these days is SGL2 inhibitors. There has been little mild concern about SGL2 inhibitors regarding dehydration and diabetic ketoacidosis. So one need to keep in mind. When we talk about any person uh, who, ha who has been a diabetic patient and who develops the diabetes with COVID-19, I think we are always at the crossroad about the anti-diabetic management. First of all, if the patient has mild sugar issues, whatever the drugs patient is continuing, it should be allowed to be continued. But if the patient becomes significantly hyperglycemic, there's a florid rise in the blood sugar levels, we need to consider certain advantages and certain non-advantageous drugs. Insulin, there is a lot of data that it reduces the renal ADM-17 expression in diabetic mice, thereby re reducing urinary ACE2 shedding and increasing the intrarenal ACE2 expression. No human data to support this poor outcome, but insulin are the drug of choice in moderate to severe hyperglycemic patient, uncontrolled diabetic patient of ketoacidosis. We can simply go ahead with the insulin and there are no issues to worry about. Metformin, truly there's no concern. It can be continued to be used in COVID-19. Sulfonylurea, we just need to be a little careful and watchful about hypoglycemia. Otherwise, there are no issues about it. Pyoglitazone, there's an upregulation of ACE2 in insulin-sensitive issue of rats, downregulation of ADAM17 in human skeletal muscle, theoretical risk of poor outcome, however, no data on human pulmonary ACE2 expression is there, so it can be continued. There are no major issues. We can go for it. If we look at this GLP-1 agonist, what we call it to be liraglutide, let's example, up regulation of ACE2 in cardiac and pulmonary tissue in rats have been found out, and theoretical risk of poor outcome, however, no data on human pulmonary ACE2 expression is there, and this can be continued to be used, especially its cardioprotective effect. SGL2 inhibitors, which are most commonly used these days in diabetic management, there is a promotion of renal ACE2 activity, theoretical risk of poor outcome. However, no data of human pulmonary ACE2 expression has been there. DPP-4 inhibitors in mice develop severe disease with mers cov DPP-4 inhibitors do not alter ACE2 activity in diabetic mice. DPP-4 inhibitors might exert overall anti-inflammatory role. Theoretically, DPP-4 modulation might help offset the cytokine-mediated acute respiratory complications of COVID-19 and can be considered as a third-line add-on drug in patients with poor glycemic control. So definitely, if at all we need to add after metformin, we can add DPP-4 inhibitor or it can be safely added to. Here, I would like to definitely mention the use of hydroxychloroquine, which has been found to be reduction in viral load. I must share with you that first three COVID-19 patients came to our institute. At that time, there was no specific treatment available, no remdesivir was available, and we were awaiting for a specific drug to be available. We tried to create a bridge between the point of no treatment 
till the point of a specific treatment come and hydroxychloroquine was found to be very effective. It is proven efficacy in reducing the virus replication in vivo and it was coupled up with the antiviral drug then. This is a quick chart of drugs being used in diabetic with COVID-19 uh, patient. We, in mild or asymptomatic patient, we can start with azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. Ivermectin and Fevivirapine has not been documented to be very effective in in vivo studies. Then came the lopinavir and ritonavir, but because of this toxicity and QT interval and safer drug remdesivir being available, they also went on backseat. And remdesivir was found to be highly effective drug, except we need to take little care of the hepatotoxic remdesivir, which need to be given on 200 milligram on day one and then 100 milligram on day, day two to nine, depending upon severity. All these patients, they not only have the pulmonary involvement in form of pneumonia, but they have a picture of ARDS and microthrombus. Hence, steroids or the methyl prednisolone was talked about as documented by recovery trial. Now, as I already mentioned to you, the first week of COVID-19 is an infective period with virus replication. So plasma pheresis from the COVID recovered patient containing the COVID-19 antibodies with this is known as convalescent COVID plasma. If given in the first week of the patient, even if he's a diabetic, it has a great effect in reducing the viral load. Lesser the viral load, lesser will be the cytokine storm in the second week, which we need to be careful about it. Now, all these patients who had inflammatory response in second week, what we call it to be cytokine storm, the monoclonal antibodies like tocilizumab could be very well used, especially in diabetic patients. But the only catch is that being uh, affecting the immunity, we need to be very careful about second to fourth week, secondary infection after using monoclonal antibodies. But here there was a race between saving the life and preventing the secondary infection. So if there is a detrimental cytokine storm, patient is going from moderate to severe disease, patient is going on ventilator with markedly rate IL-6 with uncontrolled hyperglycemia, it will be prudent to give monoclonal antibody tocilizumab, taking utmost care of suspected secondary infection, which can take care. And that's why patients need to be put on broad spectrum antibiotic. Picoplanin has been one of the broad spectrum antibiotics suspected to have the anti-COVID activity also. So glycosylated hemoglobin, more than 9%, has been linked to 60% increased risk of hospitalization and pneumonia-related severity of lung uh, infection. And diabetes was considered to be one of the predisposing factors, as I already uh, talked about. Okay, this was a one. Now, here I would like to share the florid pneumonia in diabetic patient. Why we are so concerned about diabetic patient who catching the COVID-19, why we need to be careful. Comparing the non-diabetic, the diabetic patient are more prone to have florid pneumonia. I would share the, some of the slides, which are a very early pulmonary infants in hyperglycemic or uncontrolled diabetic patient. And anti-diabetic management of COVID-19 patients, according to severity, if the patient has mild COVID-19 cases, previous medications regime should be continued. If patient has moderate COVID-19 disease, we can think of subcutaneous insulin injection, rapid acting and basal bolus we can go for, we can go for pre-mixed, but basal bolus will be preferable. And if the patient is critically ill and patient in DKA, we can think of IV insulin therapy as per the protocol. Diabetic patient will have different degree of severity of infection and must be managed accordingly. There is a florid pneumonia in diabetic patient, much faster than non-diabetic patient. I would like to share a few of the x-rays with my colleagues that how you need to be careful. There's a stage of happy hypoxemia. Even if the lungs are involved, patient may continue to have saturation of oxygen. Here is a 67-year-old diabetic male presented with chief complaints of cough and sore throat for eight days, followed by severe shortness of breath in past three days. And look at this the florid pneumonia in this diabetic patient, which was visible on the chest X-ray, much faster 
than any non-diabetic patient. There's another 85 year old patient who had diabetes with comorbid condition and absolutely he had a negative COVID RT-PCR test. Look at here, the first patient also had a negative COVID RT-PCR patient. So you don't depend in diabetic patient on negative COVID RT-PCR, but be very watchful of the pulmonary infiltrates. Look at this, a negative COVID RT-PCR patient in diabetic with comorbid condition, but fluorid COVID pneumonia. And here we should start the aggressive management. Another 58 year old male with hypertension, diabetes and hypothyroidism for eight years presented with fever and dry cough. And look at this, on sixth day of admission, patient's oropharyngeal sample came negative for COVID-19. He was discharged and advised home isolation 14 days. So on the sixth day, diabetic patient, all the three diabetic patients were negative for COVID RT-PCR, but they had a significant pulmonary infiltrate. So the important message I would like to tell you that in a COVID-19 era, if a diabetic patient has a symptom matching with any viral respiratory infection, even if RT-PCR negative, please ensure that HRCT chest is done and we can pick up the classical pulmonary infiltratory picture of COVID-19. Look at the chest X-ray. There's a classical bilateral basal peripheral opacity with obscured CP angle, bilateral peripheral glomerulus opacity with right side pneumonia, and in intermediate COVID-19 have peripheral and central involvement in spade right basal zone. These are all diabetic patients who initially were COVID-19 RT-PCR, and these are the X-ray picture of diabetic patient at a stage when COVID RT-PCR negative, but by that time they had already so much of fluorid lung involvement with maintaining oxygen saturation that speaks that there was a happy hypoxemia. Some patient who are bed -ridden, diabetic patient, I wanted to share with you, we could think of getting an ultrasound of the lung to confirm the bands of the COVID-19 infection. So even bedridden diabetic patient with comorbid conditions, if you suspect COVID-19, even if COVID RT-PCR are negative, you can think of ultrasound of lung, which is a very important investigation. So if you look at this, uh, highlights are that COVID-19 with diabetes is an important combination. Hypertension is another comorbid condition and we need to be very careful about it. Good glycemic control can improve the outcome in patient with diabetes and COVID-19. Diabetic patient will have different degree of severity of infection, must be managed accordingly. We need to be proactive in diagnosis. We need to be proactive in investigation. We need to be proactive in management of diabetic patient because their deterioration to mild, from mild to moderate disease is much faster. Hydroxychloroquine enhances chances of early recovery and possibly positively modulates overall mortality if given in very early mild asymptomatic patient. Risk of hypoglycemia is a relative lower with DPP-4 inhibitors, avoiding unfavorable hypoglycemia episodes during active COVID-19. And it could be one of the important drug to add on because of its advantage of anti-inflammatory effect. ACE and ARBs and pyoglitazone might have positive effect on COVID-19 infection in diabetic patient. It is advisable to discontinue SGL2 inhibitors due to risk of dehydration and diabetic ketosis. So I would like to conclude that diabetes itself is a pro-coagulable state. COVID-19 make it more coagulable state. We need to be very careful about new onset hyperglycemia. We need to be very careful about exaggerated diabetic response in COVID-19 patient. We need to be proactive in management of hyperglycemia and Diabetic patient need to be investigated more aggressively. They need to be, if possible, need to be treated for reducing the virus replication in first week by giving COVID antibody containing convalescent plasma. We need to be more aggressive in managing the cytokine or inflammatory response in diabetic patient. And second week, the decision about using monoclonal antibodies to save life could be taken keeping in mind this proposed secondary infection in second and third week. So overall, I think a good glycemic management is a prerequisite of good COVID-19 recovery. And at the same time, a stage of vaccination has come. Probably all diabetic patients 
especially comorbid conditions, I would strongly recommend that you should go for vaccination, even if you have suffered the COVID-19 during your lifetime. Even the first dose acts as a booster dose for the COVID recovered diabetic patient. Otherwise, second dose acts as a booster dose and it is a phenomenon antibody response. But in spite of getting vaccinated in diabetic patient, probably for a few months and coming more time, we'll have to follow the COVID appropriate behavior of masking and social distancing and hand washing. I once again extend my profuse thanks to the managed uh, management of the Epicon 21, and especially Dr. Shashank Joshi and Bansi Sabu for having given me this opportunity with profound gratitude, I re revert back. Thank you very much. is uh, really does not need any introduction. However, he's a great friend and a brother of mine and a person who's meeting him this time in Bombay after a year. Why? Because we have been seeing him more often on the uh, virtual mode or even more often on the news channels and the way he's moving forward, I hope he doesn't land into the Bollywood now. Uh, uh, he is a, a eminent personality, not only known nationally, but internationally. He has been the past president of API, and he has been the president of various endocrine and obesity associations, a great friend, a great human being, and a great orator, master teacher, 
and I would, without wasting any time, because if you really want to introduce, then you will require one full lecture for introduction only. So over to our Dean, Dr. Sashank Joshi for his Dean's address. Thank you, Dr. Upadhyay. Uh, at the onset, I welcome all of you all for this virtual EAPCon. And I'm going to talk today on the Diabetes 2020. Video is on. Yeah, also on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to talk in the next 25-30 minutes is that diabetes has a huge impact on how much we live, that is lifespan, mortality. Then I'm going to talk on some things very simple, how to manage diabetes, A, B, C, D, E, F, A for A1C, B for blood pressure, C for heart and cholesterol, D for diet and drugs, E for eye and exercise, and F for feet. Then I'm going to talk on reversal strategies, lifestyle and artificial intelligence. <clears throat> and then can we add years to diabetic life with quality? And finally, some prevention mantra. So we know that our world, though we are still in the COVID era, maximum deaths which are occurring in COVID are from non-communicable diseases. So if you have diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, or any non-communicable disease, then if you get COVID infection, you are likely to die. So premature death from non-communicable diseases is the biggest global developmental challenge of 21st century. And every year, Around 15 million people in the world die due to NCDs between 30 and 70. So the most productive years of our life, we are losing people across the world because of non-communicable diseases. And therefore, United Nations in 2011 told all the member countries to achieve a 25% reduction in premature mortality from NCDs. Whether it is stroke, whether it is heart attack, we want to save lives. And this was a 25-25 target. And our aim now by 2025 is that can we save lives of people from non-communicable diseases. They revised that target to 2030 with the Sustainable Developmental Goal target 3.4. And this is the Lancet Commission, which again says India is top of the pecking order in diabetes. Diabetes is right up there, followed by chronic respiratory diseases, ischemic heart disease, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke. So what is killing Indians? It is diabetes, lung disease, stroke, and heart disease. Can we make a difference on the lifespan of a diabetic? Remember, any person who gets diabetes has a shorter lifespan by almost a decade. To be precise, eight or nine years. Every seven seconds on planet Earth, one person dies due to diabetes. Every year, four million people die due to diabetes. Every year, 18 million people die due to heart disease and stroke. And we as Asian Indians have a special predilection within India and migrants across the globe to develop diabetes. So this was a recent study which was published in Diabetology of the lifetime risk of diabetes in metropolitan cities of India, whether I'm living in Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai, Calcutta, Bangalore, and they looked at people more than 20 years, and they studied the risk and the lifetime risk of diabetes in metropolitan cities in India is alarming based on the weight. As we put on weight, as the BMI goes up, there's a dramatic increase in the development of diabetes. So who is at risk? When the research group looked at the lifetime risk, you can see here that most people about 20, but between 60, and are obese. They are the ones who are dying. So we are losing our youngest generation to these non-communicable diseases and diabetes. And you can see that we are this Chindia. You can see China and India are fat. They are fat by population, and they have extra fat cells, though we all look very lean and thin. So we are thin fat Indians, and Chinese are also thin fat. And this is the reason we are getting this whole explosion 
and we are getting this unique metabolic syndrome of atherogenic dyslipidemic profile and this is something which we know in fact i was the principal investigator with dr mohan as a pi for the icmr in dive first part of the study from maharashtra and when we looked at tamil nadu maharashtra chatisgarh and chandigarh we found that the commonest abnormality in three fourth of the indians was low hdl followed by high triglycerides followed by high ldl and whether it is rural india or urban india we are full of heart disease and you can see that whether it's heart disease cerebrovascular disease or hypertensive heart disease we are killing indians we are unique we have a lower bmi for diabetes we have severe insulin resistance our beta cells also die fast by the time you get diabetes beta cells are gone we have typical dyslipidemia of low hdl high triglyceride high ldl the fat cells secrete a hormone called adiponectin which protects us from the harmful effects of fat unfortunately most indians have very low adiponectin there's a lot of inflammation you know we are all angry young indians so we have a lot of inflammation every time you get angry you increase your crp hscrp and inflammatory markers and then of course our muscle mass is less we don't eat proteins we are predominantly vegetarian and then we deposit a lot of extra fat we are born with less fat cells our counterparts america united states canada europe more than 40% of them are obese they are born with extra fat cells while we are born with less fat cells so our fat cells cannot expand so when we have extra fat which we eat through our fast and fried foods what happens we put that fat in the organs like <coughs> liver pancreas and the heart and we get fatty liver fatty pancreas fatty heart and that is what is our challenge we are even at birth low birth weight and thin fat our vitamin b12 is low vitamin d is low and we are getting diabetes at a younger onset so obviously you can see who has said that we are a heart disease capital of the world and we are the diabetes capital number 2 of the world and all the heart disease is driven by diabetes because we are sust and must we are sedentary indians our diet is poor we love food we thrive on food we are unfortunately the tobacco capital and smoke capital of the world also and we all feel that if we have a belly in your stomach it is like a sign of prosperity or sedji and that sedji belly which is there has become the killer for indians so it is important that you lose the fat by doing whether you do kapal bhati and you don't need any baba to tell you to do kapal bhati it has been there for 4000 years it is a part of our indian medicine stop smoking stop alcohol stop tobacco eat the right diet and do physical activity we can reverse this trend so obviously life expectancy in people with diabetes was shortened by 10 years in type 1 diabetes and if you have type 1 diabetes it is 20 years so for type 2 diabetes it is 10 years type 2 diabetes is <clears throat> it is 10 year, 10 years and 20 years respectively so one decade of your life you lose if you get type 2 diabetes and two decades of your life you lose if you get type 1 diabetes canada it is 6 years only because canada is done so well and males lose 7 years from the diagnosis females lose 7.5 years and the mortality risk goes up long time back in 2006 when i was editor of japi i had written an editorial on dr mohan's paper how people were dying due to diabetes in india and mortality rates were two fold higher and they were not surviving very well there is excessive mortality due to diabetes with higher younger people mainly from the kidney disease why because we are sedentary we don't move we love to sit in our chair and sleep in our chair we have too much of fat cholesterol triglyceride smoking and hypertension that's the challenge we have and that is why if you see across the world look at us look at china they are living longer than us because they have a larger geriatric population they are dying due to covid also indian life expectancy is around 67 to 69 years women live men better than in, in india because they are more resilient and japan is not even on the graph it is ahead of the graph because they all live up to 100 so this is our population pyramid we have the lowest number of people living above 90 lot of indians live between 70 to 90 
but we have only 13.5 lakh people living above 90 and that's something which we need to recognize so what is the impact of abcd a for a1c keep your a1c below 6.5 if your diabetes is young in the first 10 years if your diabetes for a non pregnant adult keep it below 7% if you are senior citizen you have limited life expectancy don't control your sugars very tightly go a little easy and keep it at 7.5 keep your bp below 130 80 keep your ldl cholesterol below 50 or 70 and screen for heart disease every year ensure that you take your drugs and diet and i'll talk of diet a lot do exercise even if you do 10000 steps per day unfortunately we have become exercisers of our fingers using either a television remote or using our fingers for the smartphone and the best exercise most human beings do is they strain their ocular muscles seeing their whatsapps and ensuring that their fingertips are very active that is the only exercise indians have learned either to see the television on their popular soap operas or to see their whatsapps on the phone and that will lead to a vision syndrome it is called as tv whatsapp syndrome and that will damage your cones of the retina so you do a digital detox every day and if you are a diabetic and if you continue seeing more than two hours of whatsapp every day and continuing watching television for more than three hours every day you are near certain to get macular degeneration and your risk of retinopathy goes up sixfold beyond that you need to exercise you need to be fidgety but we need to build muscle a lot of people say we get very hungry we want to eat more more you want to eat the more you need to put on muscle and look at the feet so that is the main thing so when we want to really control the sat keep your a1c below 7 number one tobacco control reduce heart disease risk reduce the dietary sodium we love our salted food reduce the household air pollution we have our household air has become smoke chamber not because of smoking but because we are living in a very close poorly ventilated environment remove all the artificial trans fat all the fast foods we eat are trans fat reduce alcohol use or avoid it and always prevent cancers so obviously if you do vigorous intensity exercise it works more you exercise the better it is and also remember please be exposed to sun if you are going to take sunlight you are actually going to be better you can see here this is data increasing sun exposure is related to lower prevalence of death from cardiovascular disease type 2 diabetes and non cancer non cvd knowledge regarding sun exposure and all cause mortality has been scant but there is very clear link between low sun exposure to risk of death just ask a question to each one of you all who are listening to my talk how much time every day you go out in the sun people are scared of the sun because they think if they go in the sun they'll get skin cancer those Particularly, the Caucasians are scared, but I don't think Indians should be scared. Our agrarian, rural people who go in the sunlight, they are living longer. So we need to understand that exposing sun very, is very, very easy. Everything in diabetes is linked to heart benefit. Better glucose control is better heart benefit. FDA mandated a lot of those things. They had these cardiovascular outcome trials. We have this 3.4 point maze. We had all these Gliptin trials, HGLD2 trials. So many drugs have come in diabetes. All these trials, whether it is Ticos, Severtimi, Examine, Carmelina, Carolina, on Gliptin, they showed hard drugs are safe when you use a drug like Gliptins. And if you use HGLD2 inhibitors, then probably they might have beneficial effects. And same is true with GLP-1 agents also. But the biggest challenge we have in diabetes today is two cycles. If you don't bicycle, then two cycles will be active. That is called as a liver cycle and pancreas cycle. My good friend and the next dean is Dr. Rajesh Upade. He is a specialist of gastroenterology. When we eat too much, what do we do? We activate a liver cycle because our liver is bombarded with fat and that will pour out. There will be a liver diarrhea of the triglyceride and that will bombard the pancreas. So you get fatty liver, fatty pancreas, we'll get a twin cycle and we'll get diabetes. By just eating less, Europeans realized it in 2004. Americans took 10 years to recognize what Europeans thought. And we had recognized it 10,000 years back from Sushrut Samhita and Charak Samhita. 
सिंपल थिंग ईट लेस डायबिटीज वॉज रिवर्स फर्स्ट बाय सर्जन ओर इज एट ऑल ऑलमोस्ट ट्वेंटी फाइव इयर्स free from diabetes <coughs> and this is professor roy taylor and professor rice taylor very clearly showed that if you just eat less and do severe caloric restriction you can reverse diabetes the direct trial showed that if you eat less and eat only 800 calories a day which is why a lot of our rishis and munis used to do in the good old days you reduce body weight you reduce glucose and you improve the action on the liver fat and insulin action on the liver so this was a trial dr taylor's group led which is a direct trial and it showed that a low calorie meal in a general practice clinic in uk could reverse diabetes by simply picking up people who are less than 6 years of diabetes people between 20 and 65 years but they were fat and not receiving insulin if you just told them to eat 800 calories per day you can reverse diabetes you are all doctors lot of lay people are practicing obesity and reversal medicine remember you as doctors can easily supervise and restrict calories and do it very easily so what did they show in direct trial they showed by reducing by reducing simply the food intake to 800 calories 50% of diabetes can be disappeared what was the philosophy they used that replace one meal with a low calorie diet create a negative caloric balance deplete the liver and pancreas fat and reverse diabetes and they were able to improve gastric emptying plasma insulin gip glucose concentration gip and cck who responded better people with shorter duration of diabetes responded better people who are younger who responded better so if you have a young diabetic short duration of diabetes if you eat less you can reverse diabetes so type 2 diabetes can be reversed the answer is yes but you can't follow these diets it's very very difficult to follow diets it is near impossible to follow these diets if i tell you know my good friend mr trivedi sitting here or amit saraf or pritam gupta that only have breakfast no lunch no dinner you know probably they will not be my friends at all they will tell me and you know they they'll go to my good friend professor milind narkar and they'll milind will say ye sashank bolta hai uska kuch suno mat okay aap breakfast lunch dinner sab khao then i have to tell them that eat less it's very difficult to follow diet Yeah. very easy to say don't eat this don't eat this but very difficult to follow so the biggest challenge we are following today in our history is to follow diet so can we use some of the technology we are using technology here i don't understand abcd of technology mr trivedi is learning with me madam sunita is learning with me from a person small young kid called anirudh anirudh is half our age but he knows technology better than us i don't know how to connect to this laptop how to see in the camera how to wear a mask and talk it's very very difficult so this is a graph of metabolism every human being when we eat has different metabolic biochemical pathways and you can see this busy graph if you can read every word of this graph you have extraordinary eyesight you don't need to eye, to go to an eye doctor but if you can't read this graph carefully you need to check your glucose and you need to check your eyes so please see this slide very carefully this is a sugar check i check if you cannot read this slide carefully artificial intelligence will tell you go to your doctor get your glucose checked get your blood pressure checked and get your eye checked and if somebody can read it i congratulate you you should get a nobel prize <laughs> artificial intelligence we have now technology where we can pick up good signals of health our mood signals of happiness and causal signals and device policies for precise nutrition precise medicine and precise insults so how do we pick it up long time back professor franz halberg who is from university of minnesota 1973 and 1976 published in the lancet that if you eat only breakfast in the morning you lose weight if you only eat dinner at night you gain weight and he also showed in 
with his wife german consilian who still is alive and works on chronobiology that if you only have breakfast you live longer if you only have large dinner you live shorter so the moral of the story is that if you want to live longer and stay healthier have a large breakfast moderate lunch light dinner or no dinner if you want to live shorter and gain weight then skip breakfast have mild lunch and have a large dinner it's a sure shot remedy to die and this is published work almost 3 decades back and this is something which we know so we need to definitely improve the quality of life so unfortunately we are born in times of plenty we have everything in excess but our body engines are running in a famine mode in india we used to have sukhas our body engines still think because generations to generations our body has been adapted to famine and that is why our every cell of our body thinks that they are hungry and they want to eat more so what we are doing whatever we get we keep on eating whatever we get we keep on eating and that is why we keep on putting that fat and lowering that muscle and we don't like to exercise so what has happened is if we want to change the diabetes numbers of india we are the world number 2 my plea to everybody who is listening to this talk is that we need to change the world diabetes numbers and if you want to make a honest effort to change the world diabetes numbers the first thing which we need to do first thing which we need to do is that we need to ensure that we need to eat appropriately we need to eat less second thing we need to do is we need to be active we need to be active so eat healthy and be active it is very very important that we build some strong muscle the easiest muscle building exercise traditionally given to us ancestrally is surya namaskar surya namaskar uthak baitak if you do you build muscle you can do when you go to a gym you can build abs but if you do simple surya namaskar you will get exposure to sunlight you will build muscle you will eat active and stay healthy and that's so crucial and so important to recognize so the prevention is better than cure and i'm going to spend my last 7 minutes i was mindful of the clock we must finish on time we have a very busy schedule is eat less eat slowly eat very fast preferably sit and eat unfortunately we stand and eat so eat less eat slowly eat and sit and relish over 20 to 30 minutes eat on time don't skip your food times the biggest mistake we made is we skip our food times whether it is for our patients whether it is for us eat a large breakfast moderate lunch light dinner if you believe in time restricted feeding it is eating only 8 or 10 hours of the day eat in the morning whatever you like for those 8 or 9 hours or 10 hours and then do fast eat the right food it is a myth that vegetarian foods don't have proteins a lot of vegetarian foods have proteins unfortunately most of the foods we consume from a vegetarian source are having a lot of fats visible and invisible both we need to walk more <clears throat> we need to be fidgety we need to do our 10000 steps every day we have to keep doing our walk walk the talk when you are on the phone keep walking okay try to do exercise be cheerful and sleep on time and sleep well world research is now on sleep 7 hours of sleep from 10 o'clock at night to 5 o'clock in the morning is the best sleep if you sleep a little early you make better interleukins which are safe they have seen all the deaths of covid have occurred at night between 2 to 5 pm and people who have slept on time have not died due to covid but something which is very important is if you sleep on time and sleep for 7 hours you will do very well to prevent diabetes but you don't sleep too much you can't sleep beyond 10 hours also and it is important we in india have a unique ability of taking stress and giving stress 
you know we are the stress bombs of the world because we are the world's capital for software so we are supposed to have something called jugad we cannot say we cannot say no to anything everything is possible and in that we generate stress on ourselves and others and therefore you should be always smiling cheerful i can see dr upadhyay is mask is still smiling and that is a very good thought and i am happy that we are doing this hybrid meetings but i hate hybrid meetings i uh, i either we should do it virtually or we should do it physically and i hope that from the during covid era we move into after covid era and we will be able to have a maskless physical meeting so i'm certain that you know in the last 3 to 5 minutes i have we have listened we have learned and we have to adapt only two messages i want you to take home in diabetes today in 2011 we were the world number country, one country in diabetes we lost our first rank to china and i'm very happy that we lost our first rank to china but our aim and that time i was the president of rssdi my aim then was that india should be the diabetes care capital of the world we should do our a b c d e right keep your a1c below 7 keep your blood pressure below 130 80 keep your ldl cholesterol below 70 diet eat less eat slowly eat on time exercise 10000 steps per day look at your feet look at your eyes look at your heart regularly every year and ensure that we can take care of all our diabetics we are in modern era we are in digital era in digital era two problems have occurred we have got intoxicated beyond alcohol and smoking to digital devices whether it is your phone or your television screen or your computer screen three enemies of non communicable diseases and diabetes today is number 1 smartphone number 2 computer screen number 3 tv screen i know that you are seeing me this through these screens only either on the phone either on the television or on the uh, 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 computer screen but these three are your biggest enemies because they make you sedentary when you are watching the show you are eating you don't know how much you have eaten and that is the big problem so i urge all of you all to practice two hours of digital detox every day listen to music walk the talk wear a fitbit and move around and sleep on time if possible and sleep well i feel we need to ensure that we change the numbers of diabetes in india i think it is not in my hands but it is not in the hands of each one of you i think each one of you is a diabetes specialist every specialty you practice diabetes is there whether it is gastroenterology whether it is dermatology whether it is nephrology whether it is cardiology in fact our cardiology colleagues and nephrology colleagues are so excited with the new drugs that they feel that the drugs like hglt2 inhibitors are not drugs of diabetology at all they feel they are cardiological drugs and nephrological drugs and they have already started treating them in fact all physicians should treat diabetes endocrinologists a tertiary care referral specialist only for difficult and complex cases because you remember one thing humanly we don't have the doctor population ratio to treat every diabetic in india currently we have around 80 million diabetics in india and we need to reverse those numbers and we have equal number which is pre diabetic so i think if you truly want to make a difference i think it is your responsibility to get the indian diabetes numbers down by ensuring that each diabetic gets the right medication gets the right lifestyle advice takes a tablet to control the ldl cholesterol like a statin takes an ace or arb to get the blood pressure under control and prevent kidney disease ensure that they follow diet and exercise well and take care of their feet well that's all i have to say thank you for a patient hearing jai icp jai api and jai hind Shashank, I must say, as expected, you've given an excellent, a masterly, and a very informative oration, and you have provided such practical tips, not only for health promotion, but for diabetes prevention, 
that I think one and all should follow in their daily life. You have also, in addition, summarized my lecture, which I'm giving tomorrow, that diabetes really originates from the liver. You have summarized that in just one slide. So uh, I'm really very grateful for your wonderful oration. I'm sure everybody enjoy it. And we, I would like uh, everyone to give him a big hand. Ladies would like to say something. Thank you. I think we can go to the next session. Oh, giving me company. Um, I'm Dr. Amit Ghosh, Professor of Medicine uh, at the Mayo Clinic, and the topic of discussion today is pedagogy in medicine, how to become an accomplished medical educator. I uh, thank you for the invite. I have no financial disclosures. I have consulted uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Professor, Professor Shubha Ramni of the Harvard Medical School uh, as a part of preparation for this uh, talk. The three points I'm going to cover today is I'm going to review the key clinical principles and strategies, uh, which are, which are evidence-based and efficient. We're going to reflect on the challenges and develop solutions. And I'm going to also talk on the new strategies that participants could uh, adopt in their own teaching um, as far as uh, uh, education and giving feedback to learners are concerned. Regarding the first point of reviewing the key clinical uh, teaching principles and strategies, it's important to realize that there are different ways where instructions are delivered and the retention of knowledge uh, depends on how it is delivered. Uh, we remember only 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we see and hear, 70% of what we say, and 90% of what we say and, and then we do something. So hands-on instruction uh, and carrying out a project is probably the best way of retaining uh, knowledge. The traditional pillars of medical education are the four ones which I've listed here, medical knowledge, communication skills, physical exam skills, and problem, problem solving skills. However, unfortunately in medical school, um, minimal emphasis is placed on communication skills, uh, which is an important part of professionalism and how uh, we do our day-to-day -day work. Uh, increased emphasis on communication skills will definitely improve all aspects of medical education. What do we expect our learners to learn uh, in the current era? We, we want them to learn uh, about new knowledge and assess the understanding of it, uh, the generic skills that would be required to work, the cognitive skills on how they uh, do critical thinking, subject specific skills based on the topic which is being discussed, and develop a good attitude and, and overall professional development. So these are the skills which learners uh, have to know and they have to be assessed on it. The Bloom's taxonomy uh, is important when we are assessing skills. When it is assessing knowledge skills or cognitive domain, the medical decision-making and medical knowledge of the, of the students are evaluated in this domain. When it is skills, uh, we have to uh, evaluate the psychomotor domain on how they are performing um, um, practical skills. So we can examine how are they performing physical examination, how are they performing procedures and surgeries, how is their communication during case presentation, interaction with colleagues, how do they phrase consult questions, and how is the patient's interactions. And finally, note writing. These are all very important skills uh, which come under the psychomotor domain. When it comes to attitude, it's called the affective domain. Um, the skills which are, which are evaluated is skills of professionalism, their values, emotions, and feelings. Under pressure, are they able to control their emotions and feelings 
is a very important part of professionalism and that needs to be assessed. The adult, adult learning experience is quite different. Uh, on the left side, you see a teacher-driven um, uh, instruction, which is how all of us have been trained in medical school. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's called the pedagogy, which is very teacher-centric. However, when it comes to lifelong learning, retention of the new knowledge, uh, a learner-centric um, experience is important using adult learning experience. This is called androgyny. As you can see, there are a bunch of uh, adult students sitting around bringing their experience, their knowledge, uh, coming to a table, having a shared decision-making as to what and how uh, the knowledge is processed, retained, and applied. And this is the way adults learn. And that's, that's how in several sessions, the workshop, workshop sessions in API, I've seen uh, the similar technique being used, which is highly effective. Now, what are the uh, educational climate? How is the educational climate of, of teaching um, arranged? We use the mnemonic space using the Maslow's hierarchy. Most important is the physiological needs, um, which is right there in the bottom, where uh, the person should have shelter, clothing, um, have good, good uh, social needs. Then are the safety needs. Uh, there has to be a safe uh, look, place to learn. The person has to be feeling safe in the hospital and property has to be safe. Then it comes to the actualization, which comes to desiring to become uh, the, to be, to be what they can be. So self-actualization is a very important thing. C stands for community, which is a community of love and belonging where um, the burnout, uh, I have a separate talk on burnout, having a good community could relieve uh, or decrease, diminish burnout in the individual and also um, making sure E stands for esteem, that they're respected, student is recognized, they're recognized and, uh, and, and get good feedback, which will help them grow. Most important is uh, the teaching arena. Uh, where can teaching be done? Anywhere patient care is being discussed, we can have teaching. It can be done in the wards, outpatient, in the specialty settings, in structured patient teaching sessions, in grand rounds, in case-based conferences, and more recently, through virtual learning through Zoom, as we are doing at the present moment. What are the outcomes that the learners will be able to do? And this is important in learning. And there are several outcomes. They should be able to interpret signs and symptoms, explain the basic science between the signs and symptoms, formulate an effective differential diagnosis, not a big list of differential diagnosis, which has very uh, little um, um, standing behind uh, or explanation uh, to explain the signs and symptoms. They need to be able to describe the pathological process, uh, explain the investigation plan to the patient, uh, able to interpret clinical data to inform diagnosis, make a management for the patient and predict prognosis. So these are all very important uh, way of what outcomes that, are, that can be studied and uh, one needs to emphasize in, in their learners. We have different learning styles and all of us have different learning styles. Some of us use combination learning styles. It could be, it's, it's called the WARC model. V stands for visual learning. A is auditory learning. V, R is reading and writing learning. And K is kinesthetic, which means you feel and you learn. A, sub, uh, it, a study of uh, students have found out that the, the, the surface learners, they're extrinsic learners. They're bothered about marks. They're very scared of failure. They emphasize rote, rote learning and they're always worried about uh, or emphasize assessment. While the deep learners, they're intrinsic, they have curiosity, commitment, they analyze new knowledge and they seek understanding, hence they are deep learners. It has been found that the best students are strategic learners where they use a combination techniques when they have to survive and marks are important. They use superficial learning techniques. However, uh, to have deep understanding, they use deep learning techniques and they use any of these uh, uh, styles, uh, either visual, auditory, renal, I mean, uh, reading and uh, kinesthetic approach to enhance their learning experience. So this is important that all learners are not same and we should not expect uh, and, uh, and assess learners uh, based on what our own learning styles are. We, do, we have to do a holistic evaluation of the learners. It's important to know the generation uh, which is undergoing, uh, which is in medical school now. They've been born between 1982 and 2002. 
these are the millennials. Their learning styles are very different from my learning styles. When I was in medical school, they, uh, their learning styles involve group study and teamwork. They use technology. They have zero tolerance for delays and they are uh, used to multitasking because they get feedback immediately and all of them are used to Nintendo where they get feedback immediately. How can be used in learning? Well, simulation with immediate feedback has been helpful to this group. Group activities are helpful. Having a Jeopardy style game for test review are also useful to this group as they can relate with it. And coming up with innovative interactive exercises, it's important to be interactive because they would like, uh, they don't like didactic lectures. When I'm uh, in, a, in a, a situation when I have to analyze our, uh, a student, I use the RHYME uh, framework. R is reporter, I is interpreter, M is manager, and E is educator. For a second to fourth year's medical student, they should be effective reporters. They ought to have a great, uh, they should be able to report the history very well. For an advanced fourth year medical student or a PGY1, which is a first year uh, resident, they should be not only a good reporter, but they should be able to interpret the findings. And this is very important so that uh, they can plan out what tests needs to be done. For a PGY2 resident, uh, they have to be able to manage uh, several uh, uh, things, including uh, patients, uh, a, a medical student and a first year uh, medical resident. So they have to be managing. So they are good managers. They have to be reporters, interpreters, as well as managers. For a PGY3 on their way out, the final year, they should uh, uh, turn into educators while being effective in the first three categories. Now, how do I assess if there's somebody at the PGY2 level or PGY3 level who is not a good reporter or who has difficulty in interpreting findings and, in, and test results, it, resu it indicates uh, that the, there is a knowledge deficit or um, uh, which needs to be corrected. And so that all goes in the feedback to, of this resident. So this is an easy um, way of remembering uh, and assessing students. These are the different gadgets which are used for teaching. Um, learning is done with mobile devices, uh, using uh, audience response systems, uh, video cams, um, and 24-7, uh, learning has become 24-7 uh, because it's, it can be done on time, out of sight, uh, at their own convenience. So it's important to have the knowledge uh, and information available to the students in different formats because that's how they want and that's how learning is done. Coming to the next point of what is the challenges uh, to education and developing solutions. It's important to know that there are several challenges to clinical teaching. All of us have been through it. There are time pressures, the competing demands. Often the um, teaching has to be opportunistic uh, based on the cases. Sometimes the number of trainees or the level of trainees are variable, which makes teaching difficult. Uh, these days, the patients are staying for shorter time in the hospital or they are too ill or unwilling, hence teaching becomes difficult. Sometimes our clinical settings with so many in and out, uh, people going in and out are not teaching friendly. And uh, most importantly, what is heard is that teachers uh, are poorly rewarded, are uh, recognized for their teaching, and um, which also includes the respect shown to the teachers from the students have also varied, and this has been a big problem. Uh, regarding competence, one has to assess the competence of the student and the competence of teachers. Uh, there are using the Maslow's four stage of competence. As you go from the left upper upper square down, uh, there is something called unconscious incompetence, where we are unaware of the skills and our lack of proficiency. So this is completely a blind spot uh, that we are unaware completely. Conscious incompetence is we are uh, we are aware of the skill but we are not proficient. So this is a good part of learning that we can, uh, uh, once we are aware, we can learn that skill. Conscious competence is we are able to use the skill, but only with effort. So we have learned, but uh, we are still uh, early stages uh, of improving it. And the most important thing is unconscious competence, which is performing the skills and becoming automatic. It's like driving a car. We sometimes don't even think what we are doing. And we start from our home and before you know, we are, we are at work. The same thing, a, lot, a very skilled surgeon, a very skilled educator is unconsciously competent. What is most important is somebody who is unconsciously competent is really good at it, 
is expecting everybody to be in that box, which is not possible uh, because they don't take into account the years of experience and years of training that they have done. Uh, a lot of mistakes are made because they judge the other learners based on their own capabilities. And that's an error as far as I'm concerned when education is concerned. Uh, Dr. Hardin um, has come up with this uh, three circle outcome model. Um, he mentioned that the good teacher is more than a lecturer. And these are the three aspects of a good teacher. So the inner circle indicates the basic task a clinical teacher has to perform. The middle circle is a clinical teacher's approach to teaching. And the third circle is the clinician as a professional teacher. If you look at the box on the left side, what can a clinical what are the clinical tasks that a teacher has to do? He has to have time efficient teaching, he or she. They have to do inpatient teaching, outpatient teaching, teach at the bed bedside, be very good at assessment uh, of the learners in the clinical setting, and also provide timely feedback to the, to the students. Uh, regarding uh, what the approach to their teaching, which is called doing the right thing, uh, their approach, they should show enthusiasm, um, in teaching, they should apply the adult uh, learning principles, which is relevant to clinical teaching. They have to use the appropriate teaching strategies for different levels of learners. As we mentioned, every learner is not in the same level. They have to apply the principles of good feedback. And I'm going to talk about what doing a good feedback is. We have to be a good role model. We have to be professional and demonstrate that we are able to uh, provide evidence-based patient care. And we also uh, have to grasp the unexpected teaching moment, the aha moments uh, in the wards or the outpatients or wherever the teaching is happening to make a point of teaching. Teacher as a professional grows through time. It's very important. It's not a one-time deal. It's a constant in a, in a life, uh, uh, life of a teacher. This is ongoing. Um, a teacher himself or herself should solicit feedback, not only from the students, from fellow teachers and others. How am I doing? They ought to reflect on their teaching strengths and weakness. And from time to time, they sit down with a piece of paper and write what you're doing well and what you have to work on based on the feedbacks of others. We have to seek for professional development in teaching because we just demonstrated that uh, learners have changed, their millenniums, the way of learning has changed. So constant uh, learning as to uh, what is the best way of delivering teaching is important. Uh, a teacher also needs to be mentored or seek mentoring, and they have to engage in educational scholarship. Writing a paper on an educational topic really enhances, because one has to not only do the background literature search, they have to do research and engage in so many different skills and put it on paper in a concise manner, which shows, demonstrates scholarship. These are all the roles of an excellent teacher. This is a, a thing called a one minute preceptor. There are six micro skills. And I will show you what we're what we're doing when we're teaching uh, somebody, a student can be asked these six things. We need to get a commitment. We need to ask, what do you think is going on? We need to ask them for probing evidence. What led you to that conclusion? Then we have to teach general rules. Uh, when this happens, do this. You have to reinforce what was right. Specifically, I think you did a great job of something. You have to correct mis mistakes right away. Instead of saying you made a mistake, we should we should phrase our topic as, next time this happened, please try this. Identify the next learning steps. What we need to do is learn more about, indicating that there may be journals, books that they need to look about. So these are called six Microsoft micro skill sets. So here's uh, like, it can be used in a case presentation and discussion. Uh, the diagnosing of the patient takes two to three minutes. Then we need to diagnose the learner. We ask for a commitment, probe for underlying reasoning, which could take about two minutes and then teach. What do we teach? Teach general rules, provide feedback, correct errors, and identify the next steps. These are the six uh, uh, steps. It comes, uh, we have it in a form of a card. This can be laminated. These cards are present in internal medicine clinic, faculty practice clinics, in ward outpatients, and medded office. Uh, I have one of these in my pocket, uh, and very often I do it more or less uh, again and again. And as you can see, the card has given examples of each of the, of what, what are the things that narratives under each of the headings, which will help you um, use it at your own workplace. So using the, um, the, this preceptor model is helpful. The other model which we use is called the SNAPS. Uh, this is came out from Dr. Walpaw from Seattle. 
Uh, the S stands for sum summarize briefly the history and, and findings. N stands for narrow the differential to two or more possibilities. A stands for analyze the differential. P stands for probe the preceptors by asking questions. Another P stands for plan management and S stands for select a case related issue for self-directed learning. So this is not important to memorize this, but the important uh, to understand uh, the, the science behind it and the education behind it and how to make education um, in a busy setting, very uh, concise rather than very elaborative and still cover most of the important uh, topics. The last uh, point which I want to do is reflect on new strategies that, partic that participants would like to adopt in their own teaching. This is a great area and we are using what is called the experience-based learning or the SPARC model. And SPARC stands for uh, support, P stands for participation, R stands for real patient learning and, and C is capability. So when you're looking at the entire uh, experience of, uh, of a journey of a student from entering medical school to becoming finally a doctor, they are initially have to go through the preparing phase. This is the first or second year of medical school where they, we, they not only have a pedagogy of, uh, they learn about the pedagogy, they learn about knowledge, they learn about an organizational skill and the effective skill. Then comes the experiencing when they are initiated in the third years or in some schools even earlier to see patients under supervision. So there's a triad of patients, students and clinician. Um, and this is constantly being reinforced uh, uh, during their journey. Um, this has to be followed by a very important uh, area called reflection. The reflection is how did the student do in the real patient set setting and how the learning was there. And there's a back and forth, to and forth going. And the, after the reflection, one also has to study how the patient, how the student is performing. When, it's, when you assess performing, you have to look at the intellectual level of the student, the practical aspect, are they ordering the right test? Are they examining the patient properly? and the effective, how they come across, uh, are talking with the patients, talking with each other, talking with other consultants. And this is called the SPARC model and is currently uh, in vogue. Uh, it was published in Medical Teachers Journal in 2019. This is just an example of the SPARC model is, uh, there are three stages. A lot of work has to be done upfront, which is called beforehand, which is preparing on the day the patient arrives for clinical experience and afterwards. And as you can see in the form of preparation, uh, we have to check the student's capability to learn, check the patient's problem, ask the patient's consent, uh, brief the student that when they go and see the patient, just examine the liver spleen or take this focused exam rather than the whole exam. And um, when you are having that, have the tell the student that we will be observing, the, observing them in the process. They'll be rehearsing this. They can rehearse their presentation and then we'll be contributing to the learning. When they're in the experience group, uh, you have to look at whether they're providing exemplary patient care, that's important, and empower the student and patient both to co-participate. Sometimes the patients are not willing to talk with students, and that's where a clinician can talk to the patient and say why this is an important experience. And finally, reflection comes to helping the student verbalize what they, what they experienced, help the student identify, reinforce, also identify new capabilities, treat them with respect and identity, and uh, help the student identify a learning goal and how can they achieve it. A lot of students have different ways of learning. And I have long gone, given up my old habits of just giving articles to them and saying, just read my article, but that usually does not work. They have to come up with their way of learning. I can just be directing them to the right uh, source. The final and the most important thing is feedback. Feedback is just not telling, oh, you did this, you did that. Uh, feedback should be viewed from a learner's perspective. It is effective only when it is assimilated and lead to behavior change. The last part is very important. If it is not assimilated, doesn't lead to behavior change, there is no feedback. It's just uh, words spoken uh, on an empty in an empty room. So what are the three things for feedback? Uh, is to know where am I? Uh, where do I need to be and how do I get there? Uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Ramani, wrote this in Medical Teachers. I would strongly um, 
um, recommend that uh, if you have time to read the, her excellent article. So a couple of things have to be known uh, when we're giving feedback from the recipient or the student's perspective, what were the learning goals? What were the self-assessment goals? And what are the self-efficacy goals? So we ask the student these three things. Uh, what do you want to learn? And, and what do you think you would be getting from the experience? Then from our standpoint, uh, we have to base our observation, base our feedback on our observation, not